This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. On today's show, we've got a massive, jam-packed program for you. We're going to tell you about who may be coming and may not be coming over to join AEW and Impact, as well as discussing what's going on with these two WWE superstars. And let me tell you right now, it's not good. So you'll have to stick around for the news and notes section for all of that. Of course... It's a big weekend. It's a pay-per-view weekend. We've got the Elimination Chamber, and we're coming off of a fantastic AEW pay-per-view, and that has some ramifications for what took place on Wednesday. And, of course, we're going to get into all those topics and trends that's going on in the wrestling world. Doing it with me, as always. He's the one. He's the only. He is the Doc, John Macroon. What's up, cuz? What a week of professional wrestling. Oh, man. Adam Cole, Taz, Sting, Brian Cage. You had a major botch from an announcer, and now you got a major pay per view. <laughs> oh, dude, we got to talk about <laughs> that. That was great. It was awesome. I listened to it a couple of times, and I laughed because some people superimposed Vince over it. So the internet never fails. It's great. Can't wait to talk about it. Always love breaking down the world of professional wrestling. Such good shit to talk about this week. That's right. A lot of good shit to talk about. And we're kind of on a time crunch here because you've got a busy life. So. Let's just kind of jump right into it. Let's start with SmackDown. Now, I thought SmackDown was a good show, but nothing really stood out to me. We even had a returning Seth Rollins who came back, and he talked about how having a kid basically changed him, but he resorted to the same old thing. Do you think this was a bit of a wasted opportunity? Because you could have really reinvented this guy, had him come back. Now, he switched brands. He was on Raw. He's now on SmackDown. And you could have really built him up. We talked about this before. Having guys who can contend against a guy like Roman Reigns. Seth Rollins is one of those guys where he can get in the ring and you believe that he can walk away from a match with Roman Reigns besting him every time they're in there. Yet you gave us the same old character. Totally wasted opportunity, right? Has to be. Totally. That's not the best character for him. I'm surprised that they went with that version for him because it just seems like it's, it's a... It's a character that doesn't seem to have a lot of room to grow beyond the fact of what it is. So I'm of the opinion that this is going to be uh, a situation in which the angle is going to change and eventually speaking, he'll become more of the outgoing personality that he is. It just feels like you're stifling somebody that has way more to give and hopefully somebody recognizing it, uh, recognizes it, whether it's him or somebody else will just say, hey, let's unleash Seth Rollins because yes, it was a wasted opportunity. I mean, he's a dude with a ton of charisma and you put him into this weird role where it almost feels like you said he's boxed in. He's he's kind of botched in this manner. So we spend a lot of time talking about Roman Reigns when it comes to SmackDown because he is the big chip on the show. And we've kind of alluded to this happening and it looks like it's going to be the case. So Kevin Owens is going to be part of the Elimination Chamber. Roman Reigns was supposed to be part of the Elimination Chamber uh, due to some politicking and some of Paul Heyman's best work. He managed to get his way out of the Elimination Chamber and will take on whomever, whomever wins the Elimination Chamber from SmackDown, which could possibly be the aforementioned Kevin Owens. Again, going back to this same old story, this has to be the last time, right? Because I could see Kevin Owens winning the elimination, Elimination Chamber and then going on to take on Roman Reigns. And you got a built-in excuse where he just went through a grueling match. You could have him come out number one, uh, and he could have an absolutely stunner of a match to then take on Roman Reigns where he is bested. It could be quickly. It could be a long match. It could be anything you want. At the end of the day, he's gone through basically hell and back in the elimination chamber. So you don't really diminish KO star too much, but again, I don't believe he's a guy who can take on Roman Reigns. I just feel like it's a tired storyline. Very tired. And where's it going to go? How In storylines, I think everybody kind of wonders, where's it going to go? How's it going to benefit? Is it going to continue to be a situation in which Kevin Owens keeps taking L's? Or, I mean, if you really want to upset the apple cart, give Owens the belt. Let him win something and have it be meaningful because of the fact that this is a character that 
probably represents a lot of what people like. Very tough, very charismatic, and he takes massive bumps. So if you're going to go down this road again, the ending result has to be that Kevin Owens gets over. Now, a show that I don't think was as good as what we got with SmackDown. Uh, Monday Night Raw. This was Monday Night Raw's go-home angle for this weekend's Elimination Chamber. Elimination Chamber taking place on Sunday. So we had Miz back out of the Elimination Chamber. You had Sheamus get inserted into the Elimination Chamber as well as Kofi Kingston. And it seems like there's a little bit of a momentum build with Kofi. Does this have the makings of Kofi Mania 2.0? Now remember, you do have uh, Drew McIntyre still holding the belt. Drew McIntyre will be part of the Elimination Chamber on Sunday for Raw. But do you see a way where Kofi could come out the winner in all this and have the belt and we get Kofi Mania version 2.0? Uh, I could see it, but I don't think it's time. I think that, you know, unfortunately with how – this is what happens when WWE makes an epic mistake. When you, when, <laughs> when you take the belt They're off – They like the retcon history is what they like to do, huh? Exactly. When you take the belt off of them in five seconds, you diminish the belief that this is a worthwhile champion. I, I understand that, you know, this is a character that people love and adore, but is he really at this point in time – somebody ready to take the next step up to become a world champion again? No. They could rush him to do it, and they may indeed, in fact, uh, give him an oppor- another opportunity. But, unfortunately, he's not the, he, he's squarely in the mid-card, and they got to do something then to, you know, I would even stick with, you know, breaking up the New Day and having them feud with each other, and then, you know, have him win a couple feuds and then get him back in the title picture. Have him go through, uh, you know, have him go through members of the New Day, have him go through AJ Styles, have extended feuds, and then maybe at next year's Rumble reintroduce him as a main event player. But he's not a main event player. You know, you, you in my eyes, Kofi's less than The Miz. Less than The Miz, eh? In my mind, I think that The Miz, you know, I was that, disappointed. That's, those are some strong words, less than The Miz, because at this point, The Miz is, Miz is just a promo right now. Right. Miz hasn't done anything. Right, but I think he's charismatic. I think that uh, the money in the bank angle, hopefully now that, that when he cashes in, he'll actually have a chance to win the title. I just think that uh, Kofi just hasn't been, you know, when he when he loses the title that way, the year that he had, going back with the New Day, the injury, I just don't see him as a main event guy right now. What about this? What about if Kofi wins in the Elimination Chamber, right, and Miz comes in and cashes in on Kofi winning in the Elimination Chamber, You have Kofi holding the title for a brief second to then have Miz win the title, and you've got both of your guys getting over. How do you feel about that? (laughs) I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm just throwing it out there. Never going to happen, but really interesting stuff. I don't think it's going to go that way. Look at this. Drew McIntyre is the former champ. He's supposed to have have a rematch clause somewhere. I mean, I know Finn Balor didn't in his contract, whatever. But, I mean, Drew McIntyre's got to have one, so then Drew can win it right back. Drew's got to be headlining WrestleMania, man. He's gonna he's gonna do his thing. All right. What is, speaking of headlining, Bad Bunny headlining. <laughs> he's now your twenty four seven title champion. What the hell is going on here in WWE? Why do we have this belt that means absolutely nothing? That our truth can win six hundred and ninety four times in a weekend to now have a Bad Bunny's a rapper, right? He's a rapper. I don't think he's R and B singer, but I'll have a rapper win. Uh, what are we doing here, man? Help me. Please help me. Listen, man, they always want to have somebody with a star name, with an influence. And that's what I think pisses off wrestlers is like, okay, you brought in an influencer rapper in here. That's what you did. And unfortunately, <laughs> that's what happened. And that's what they did. And, and look, I'm actually very shocked that they've continued uh, along this path of having um, uh, to continue to have this 24-7 title. I thought it would end by now. And it didn't happen. So, hey, <laughs> what are you going to do? But I'll say this about Raw. I like the gauntlet match. I thought Sheamus winning it was awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I thought the Kofi Kingston-Miz match was good, even though, you know, I said Miz is better. You know, Kofi went over. But I liked the early portion of Raw. I thought it was really good. Yeah, I just I felt like that show kind of after that just petered out. Exactly. It, to me, it was just kind of a bunch of question marks. Speaking of question marks, this is interesting. They can do something here. I don't know what they're going to do. I have an idea of what they might do, but this is interesting. So Lacey Evans is set to take on Asuka at the Elimination Chamber. Okay? You have Lacey Evans feuding with Charlotte Flair, and there's a storyline there that's brewing. Turns out Lacey Evans is pregnant. 
And her announcing that she's pregnant was something that creative found out late in the day on Monday and they had to do a hard pivot and they're like, screw it. We'll work it into the show. So now you've got Lacey Evans who's pregnant taking on Oscar this weekend as of this moment in time when we're recording the show, the card hasn't changed. So she's going to be in our predictions, but you have Lacey Evans taking on Oscar. You also have Lacey Evans feuding with Charlotte flair. She announces to the world that she's pregnant. And for me, knowing Vince, knowing what he likes, there is only one way this goes down. Only one way this goes down. She's going to claim it's Ric Flair's kid. Ric Flair is going to do his strut and he's going to do his little thing. Going to go talk to Charlotte about how she's going to be, uh, be have a new sister and slash auntie, whatever you want to do. And in the end, it's going to turn out it'll, it, it won't be crush Ric Flair's heart. Um, Lacey Evans at some point has to get written off TV. I don't know how they go about doing this. I don't know how this match is going to play out with Oscar. I don't even know if we're going to have a match, but Holy cow. What a way to throw some fly in the ointment. Like, look, happy for Lacey Evans getting pregnant, but this creative and this storyline, even though it's a little bit tired, it was a little bit interesting. I think it was starting to get a little bit more interesting because you had Charlotte basically redirected away from anything going on with the championship. And I think this allowed you to, to, to kind of let other women kind of challenge Asuka even though I don't think Asuka's a great ladies champion, just it, it, and it's more of the way that they position her. And it's more of what creative does with her. Um, but I think what you have here now is you had a storyline going and you had two of them going one with Asuka, one with Charlotte. You also had the side story with uh, Ric Flair. And I think all that can kind of get wrapped up with the pregnancy, but I think long-term for what you had in mind for your long-term storyline this is a massive, like I said before, fly in the ointment. What was your take on Lacey Evans announcing she's pregnant and it actually being true that she's for real, real life pregnant? Well, I was a little bit disappointed in that I thought Lacey had a chance to be a world champion. I just thought that the angle was great with Ric Flair. Throws a wrench, like you said. I just feel like, man, you lost Becky Lynch. Now you lose Lacey Evans, who I thought was going to be a star. I guess you just got to kind of now repurpose this and you got to start doing the Bianca Belair, Charlotte, Asuka. You know, you really, right now, it's really interesting in the women's division is that the top stars are there, but we've seen them in a lot of different matches. You now got to work in the younger women talent and bring them up. Lacey Evans, I thought, was perfect with with Ric Flair and everything. They're not going to be a match. I don't see it. I just I don't, I don't. I don't think so either. We, we, look, we still have to make a yeah. prediction because it's what's on the card. Yeah. This, is how I, this is how I think you can spin this. Because don't forget, Rhea Ripley has been called up to WWE. Yeah. She's on the Raw roster. She hasn't really done a whole lot, but she's on the Raw roster. She's no longer in NXT. You haven't really seen her. They, Charlotte, and when I say they, Charlotte and Rhea Ripley have a bit of a history. And you can go back to that if you need to, right? So Lacey Evans has to get written off TV. Lacey Evans has to go away for a little bit. You can have Rhea Ripley come in pick a fight with Charlotte and you can have those two good, do really good business. That's a match that I would love to see at WrestleMania. That's a match. I would love to see uh, Rhea Ripley go over at WrestleMania to get revenge on Charlotte for costing her, her title in NXT. And remember Charlotte cost Rhea Ripley that title in NXT. And then on her way out the door, put nobody over. And it was one of those things that really diminished a lot of momentum that Rhea Ripley had. You just talked about it. If you're at the top, there's, there's a lot going on with those women, with those four, five, six, maybe seven women. But you don't have anybody in the middle to really fill that out. I think Rhea Ripley could slide into that middle position. And you can bring a couple other people along, too, to slide them in, into that middle position, that, that upper mid, mid-card class, and really help bolster that part of the roster and really let that start to kind of take off a little bit and give them more than, you know, a segment here, a segment there, and, and give them more than five minutes on TV. You could really do some work. Like, Rhea Ripley can go for 20 minutes. You could squeeze a fantastic 20-minute match out of her and be just gripped to your chair. So I think that's kind of how you need to to adjust and, and kind of to, to pivot here a little bit. Would you be opposed to something like that? Not at all. I, I love what you said, man. Let it rip. Rhea Ripley. Charlotte, and I think that the the other women that are going to be maybe having to be looked at, Mandy Rose, uh, Dana Brooke, you got to start to evolve some of these women to get into it, and uh, Bianca Belair, absolutely. I'm excited to see her evolution, but 
for Lacey Evans, it is what it is. And mm-hmm. uh, sometimes you just got to realize that uh, family comes first, and it does kind of put a damper on a, sh- a shining star that I thought was going to take over for the next two or three years. For sure. Now, on Sunday, we had a fantastic NXT pay-per-view. I'm not sure if you watched it or not, but it was great. It left us with a ton of question marks, and you had to tune in on Wednesday. Basically, at this point, Undisputed Era is over. Adam Cole ends up super kicking uh, Finn Balor and super kicking Kyle O'Reilly on Sunday night. This is after uh, Orny Loken and Danny Burch and Pete Dunne ended up attacking Finn and attacking Kyle. Um, they all came undisputed era came down to make the save and you could tell something just wasn't right. Adam Cole wasn't even hiding it in the least bit. Super kicks Finn. Kyle O'Reilly's like, what are you doing? Super kicks, uh, Kyle O'Reilly. Kyle, we opened the show with Kyle O'Reilly demanding Adam Cole come down and answer for his actions. And what do you get? You get Finn coming out. You get Roderick strong coming out. Uh, this leads to what will eventually become a six way tag as Danny Birch, Orny Loken, and Pete Dunn end up coming out. And in the end, end of the show, uh, you have Adam Cole come down and do a brain buster on the stairs. And WWE committed to this angle, committed to this angle hard, so hard that you had to have uh, the wrestlers go out and confirm that they were okay. Basically, they sold that. Kyle O'Reilly at the end of the show had a seizure and was pretty banged up after that brain buster on the steel steps. Uh, he was stretchered off and Adam Cole looked like he kind of took the worst of it as he like messed up his back a little bit doing the brain buster uh, on the, on the steps. Uh, but he ends up rolling into the ring, uh, and basically stands over Finn Balor who was knocked out and holds up the championship belt. Undisputed era is dead done. And I think this happened in a way that neither one of us really seen happening, which I think makes it kind of cool. But at the same point, leaves me wanting a little bit more because I think maybe it just happened a little bit too soon. I want to know how you would have did it a little bit different if you would have done it different at all. And if you think maybe we should have stretched the storyline out just a little bit longer. No, in this case, they handled it just right. I think everybody knew what was coming and now we can kick it off and see what's actually going to go down. And Undisputed Era needed to go away. I felt like uh, you don't need to extend this out. Right now, with NXT really struggling in the ratings against AEW, you kind of needed this kind of turn in order to kind of jumpstart some interest and jumpstart the next kind of wave of feuds after the pay-per-view. So no doubt about it, I thought it was absolutely well done. Adam Cole needs to be this badass person, badass heel, and you got to handle business. Undisputed Era ran its course. It, it, it did its thing. Now shine the light on Adam Cole, and let's let, let's kick this bad boy off. I can't wait to see how this plays out in the next few months. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see kind of what they do here. Now, look, they totally committed to it. Like I said, uh, Kyle O'Reilly had to come out on Twitter on Thursday morning and say, hey, guys, I'm okay. Everything is fine. Uh, I thought this was done fantastic. I, I, they, they executed it to perfection. It was, it was great. Um, a few months ago, we talked about them splitting up and it finally happened. It happened differently than we thought it was going to happen. Uh, we thought that, uh, Adam Cole was going to possibly turn face. Kyle O'Reilly was going to also turn uh, face. And then we thought maybe Kyle O'Reilly would turn heel in the end. We have Adam Cole now turning heel and we have Kyle O'Reilly turning face. So great job here. Something else that I took out of NXT. And it's something that both of us know and something that you know because you watch Impact. You're about to give us your your Impact review here very, very shortly. MSK is fantastic. MSK was brought down to the ring to accept their Andre the Giant uh, tag team championship. Or no, the it was the Dusty Rhodes uh, uh, classic trophy for, for tag teams. And uh, they ended up bringing down the ladies as well as you had um, – Raquel Gonzalez and um, I can't remember her name off the top of my head right now. Uh, So bad podcasting on me, but they brought them all down. And what you end up having happen is Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler come down to the ring and they basically challenge the ladies for a tag match that'll take place on NXT this upcoming week in the back corner with Beth Phoenix. You have MSK. They've got tubs of popcorn and they are so into watching these two women cut promos on each other. MSK made that whole made that whole bit 
totally bearable and made it outstanding. MSK is a group that if you're not paying attention, I think you need to start paying much closer attention and look at how charismatic these guys are. On top of that, they're fantastic in the ring and they are excellent, excellent with promos. I'm not sure what you took away from this angle, but I was blown away. Like you had Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, two, two, two tag team champs right there, right? Going up against two up and coming stars in NXT. And the whole time, all I could do is focus on MSK. That shows you how good they are at what they do. Blown away by MSK. I think they were fantastic. Wow. What a potential. What uh, a tag team. What can, w- The great thing is now that I think you and I are both paying attention to is what's going to happen next. Who are they going to take on the feuds? Imagine them on the main roster going up against the Street Profits, going up against the best tag teams um, on WWE. I know they're going to have a good run uh, and handle their business in NXT. But, yeah, MSK, what more can be said? They gel well. They are obviously over. And the good thing is in tag team wrestling, when a tag team has been together for this period of time, you you know that they're naturally a tag team. And it harkens back to the old days where you had, you know, elite tag teams like the Hart Foundation and things like that. So MSK has all the moveset. They got the tag team wrestling down. They were the natural winners. And for me, I always get it. I always love to see, uh, you know, William Regal just based on the nostalgia that we all felt when he was a wrestler at WCW. And anytime, you know, he's out there, he's, he's played his role really well. And he's definitely an asset to the company. MSK, their future's bright. Can't wait to see what they're going to do now in the, in, in the coming weeks. Yeah, me too. It's going to be interesting to see how they're utilized. I think this is a team that should rocket to the top of the to the tag team division. Uh, they're absolutely fantastic. I, I do want to get into Impact. Before we move on to Impact, I want to see if there was anything else that you wanted to touch on with NXT um, because I do want your Impact review because I think Impact, uh, it, it seemed like it was a pretty good show. Absolutely. No, NXT was solid. Uh, I do think that Finn Balor is going to have his hands full in the coming weeks with all the new challengers that are going to come and uh, take on his title. Uh, Impact definitely was better. Again, disappointment were the women. I just thought that, you know, I get it. They're trying to push over to Neil Dashwood, but uh, her victory over Nevaeh just... uh, just didn't do much. It was an average match. Didn't do a whole heck of a lot. In terms of what Impact really wanted to do, they wanted to establish and continue the massive run of Moose. And him defeating Tommy Dreamer was awesome. I think in the past year, they've really tried to uh, elevate Moose with his feuds with e- with EC3, with the matches that he has. Dude, this is an ex-football player, and he's got the present. He's got the tools. And so the main event saw Moose defeat Tommy Dreamer who's obviously, you know, enjoying a nice run, you know, after he turned 50 years old. Uh, the first hour was pretty good. You had, um, in the first match there, you had uh, Josh Alexander taking on TJP for the X Division Championship, and TJP obviously was going to defeat Alexander all the way around. Uh, you had a fatal four-way match. You had Trey Miguel versus Suicide versus Willie Mack uh, and Davari. And, you know, the X Division, I think, has been handling themselves pretty well. Uh, Miguel, wow. You know, he's a guy that, you know, I think is now going to start to emerge as an individual that you got to definitely pay attention to in the coming weeks and months. And he got over on this one. You know, I was more of the opinion that Matt Cardona should have potentially stayed at uh, AEW, but I think he's relishing the opportunity to get some TV time. He, he got a victory over Hernandez. Wasn't the best match, but He's building his brand and doing his thing, so he's now become a regular on Impact. The show was good all the way around. I thought the best match was the Finn Juice versus Reno Scum. Really fun. I thought it was a good match. Um, Robinson and Finley defeated Reno Scum, so I thought that it was, uh, you know, a real interesting, you know, use of uh, the characters there and, you know, Robinson and Finley. Eh, interesting, you know, interesting, interesting in terms of, you know, these mid-card guys and how they're going to start to uh, utilize the working relationship with New Japan. And I like it, you know, obviously I've watched New Japan. I've seen what they've been able to do and to have these characters kind of come over. It's going to be nice to see. And uh, like we said, Nevaeh, Tennille Dashwood, eh, 
could be <laughs> it's just it's just disappointing because <laughs> I expect a lot more. I expect a lot more from what I saw, and it just it didn't deliver. So all in all, B plus show, and I think it's time now to let Moose do his thing and really unleash him in in the coming weeks. All right, I want to transition into AEW here, and I think at least in in the first hour, the the biggest thing was watching Sting take a massive bump from Brian Cage. Sting takes a a power bomb from Brian Cage. Mind you, this is his first action since, I think, 2015? If I remember correctly, it was maybe 2015. So six years. His His first ring action in six years is to get picked up by a guy who looks like he should be a bodybuilder and slam to the mat. How surprised were you that Sting's first bump is a power bomb by Brian Cage? Because I was blown away. I was blown away too, uh, because you had Taz in the ring talking crap. Sting music's play. You think, okay, Sting's gonna get over in this uh, little segment, and boom, Brian Cage, you know, boom, drops and delivers a nice power bomb. I thought it was delivered safely, and I think for Sting, as long as it doesn't involve sustained beatdowns. One epic move like that, he should be able to handle. It's just basically a glorified bump from a higher spot, which he's done a thousand times. So I was okay with it. It was cool to see. Was it too soon to have Sting, you know, take a a bump like that? Maybe, you know, but I know everyone cognitively is like, oh, this is a 60-year-old taking a bump. But this is something he's done a thousand times. And a power bomb to the mat should cause no damage. So good on it. I think Brian Cage looked like the monster, and that's how you're supposed to portray him. Each and every I time. I mean, a, a couple, uh, was it a couple weeks ago, we were talking about Sting, we're like, ah, oh, just come in, don't maybe bump around too much, just try to play it safe a little bit. No, man, this guy is back, and he's 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 ready. He's ready to go. He just got slammed through the mat by Brian Cage. So it, it was just it just kind of ran in the complete opposite direction of everything that we thought might happen and everything that we kind of wanted to happen to kind of preserve Sting's body. They said, screw it, ripped it all up, threw it out the window. So it was it was shocking to me. I, I want to know how you see this tension building with the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, the Good Brothers. H- how do you see all this playing out? Because the Young Bucks were in a fantastic match against Santana and Ortiz. And they end up getting a, a roll-up win, which I know you're always a fan of the roll-up. And you have the rest of the inner circle come out and basically just dismantle the Young Bucks. And in the back, you've got Kenny Omega, who's looking at the at the monitor, and you've got Don Callis. And Kenny's like, "We need to go out there. We need to go out there." And Don Callis is like, "No, no, 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 no. Hold off a little bit. Hold off a little bit." Eventually, sending the Good Brothers out there, but obviously, way, way, way too late, like minutes late. How do we see this tension building and bubbling over? Because if you remember, Young Bucks, Kenny Omega. They were they were like a find that foundational piece. They were I mean, you had Kenny Omega and Adam Page break up and the Young Bucks sided with Kenny Omega. You now have Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks kind of seem like they're on the outside looking in with the Good Brothers right there at his right hand side, along with Don Callis being the ultimate puppet master, which I think yeah. is fantastic. It's a really interesting storyline. Obviously, I think you can probably have to split it up and have the Good Brothers take on the Young Bucks, right? Because. I think that uh, Young Bucks don't need to be part of this. I think Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers can play this out uh, from their previous relationship. Or it's all a big swerve and they're all together and they're going to continue their rampage. But best case scenario, Young Bucks take on the Good Brothers and we have a nice healthy feud. But I felt like the new WWE champion, Kenny Omega, (laughs) definitely did the right thing there, baby, by, uh, you know, setting up a a death match. The new so, okay. WWE champ. <laughs> let, 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 let's pause for a second. Let's because I want to talk to you about this this exploding death match from hell. Um, I want to talk about Jr. Real quick. Oops. He look can't do that. And, and I mean this with all sincerity. <laughs> I mean this with all sincerity, man. He is he is a jewel in wrestling. Like he really is. He is fantastic. Some of the best moments of our childhood <laughs> watching wrestling. He was he was the voice for it. And the guy has the guy probably knows more about wrestling and can evaluate wrestling talent and put a story together for wrestling. He's forgotten more than you and I will ever know, okay? But this man is past his age, past his prime. He needs to I, I they need to find something else for him to do because it, it's not like it's just this week where he calls Kenny Omega the WWE champion. Like, wait, what? No, you're an AEW. 
he has mess ups and he has trouble following the action. Like he'll be so far behind on what is actually unfolding. He's calling a move that took place almost 30 seconds ago. And we've completely moved on into something else that is a little bit more dangerous and a little bit more over the top that we should really be talking about. And he even messes up the moves names. Like I said, he's forgotten about, he's forgotten more in wrestling than me. You'll ever know. He's like forgotten moves names. That's how much he knows. But it, he, he does this every week. And it really detracts from what is being put on from from television. It really cuts into the storyline. It almost takes you out of of the moment. And I think wrestling is one of those things where, look, we all know what this is. And we all are here willingly buying in and believing what is being forced down our throats, right? Like we are all believing that that Kenny Omega uh, is is going to allow the Young Bucks to get pounded on um, and, and allow Don Callis to manipulate the situation. So then the good brothers can go out moments later to, to save them. Like we're all allowing this. We all know that this flaming death match from hell, that's going to take place with John Moxie and Kenny Omega. We're all, we're all believing like, Oh my God, this is going to be horrible. All the barbed wire. It's going to be so bad. It's real barbed wire. That's real barbed wire guys. And there's going to be something that's going to explode. It's a real bomb guys. Like we're all buying into this make believe land. And this man takes you out of the moment all the time. Yeah. I just I'm I'm kind of done with Jr. Yeah, I think they're gonna eventually transition him to to stay backstage, and that's just what it is. He's older. Maybe we'll see if if this kind of uh, epic mistake calling Omega the WWE champ, if that will uh, sharpen him up a little bit. But dude's older. He's a legend, and I don't know. We'll see how uh, Tony Khan handles this as this, as it progresses, because you have a great announcer in the wing in Chris Jericho. We'll see how this progresses moving forward. But I can't wait to see it. Deathmatch, Kenny Omega. And John Dude, Moxley, it's gonna be sweet. What did you think about that? Because it's be sweet. to me, that that screamed, that screamed, like ICP hardcore wrestling to me. <laughs> like, what what are we doing? I think that that's you have to continue the feud and culminate it, and that's how these guys want to go down. And uh, more power to them, man. I guess I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, I which might much rather have some type of a match. I thought for sure we we're getting a buried alive match, and I was all for that. I'm not really for this backyard exploding barbed wire <laughs> wrestling match. All right, let's get into some predictions. Um, this is this prediction. Again, this is the card that we have and things will change. I'm telling you that they are going to change because we have a pregnant lady <laughs> on the card. So things will change. But right now, while we're recording, this is what we've got. This is what we're going with. And this is a massive card. We both know that we're probably not going to get half of these matches, but we're going to throw them out there and we're going to see what we get. And we're going to, we're going to try to predict as best we can. We've got the WWE Championship. This is this is uh, Monday Night Raw's Elimination Chamber. You've got Drew McIntyre, who's the champion, taking on Randy Orton, AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Sheamus, Kofi Kingston in the Elimination Chamber. Who do you have coming out victorious? Obviously, the champ, baby. It's going to be Drew McIntyre. I think that this is going to be a great opportunity to have a big match, and it's going to be violent, vicious. All these individuals are going to be definitely, definitely vying to get over. But I think this is a great opportunity to have Drew McIntyre get over and uh, win, win the Elimination Chamber. Yeah, so I want to go I want to go Drew McIntyre as well. Um, I'd love to pick somebody else, but I, out of that list of names, there's nobody that I want to put the title on. So I'm going to go Drew McIntyre winning this one. Now, in an interesting twist, I uh, mentioned it a little bit earlier when we were talking about SmackDown. The, the actual Universal Champion will not be taking... Uh, place in this match that will ha be happening in the Elimination Chamber. He will instead be challenging whoever wins the Elimination Chamber. So you've got Baron Corbin, Kevin Owens, Cesaro, Daniel Bryan, Sami Zayn, and Jey Uso all entering the Elimination Chamber. Who do you have coming out to then face, and I'm assuming lose, to Roman Reigns? Yeah, this is going to be tough. Is it Kevin Owens? Is it Cesaro? For me, it's a combination of those two. And I want to say Cesaro so bad because he needs it. He's mm -hmm. this is an individual that needs to get over, but it just makes sense based on what we've seen. It's going to be Kevin Owens. Uh, you know what? I'm in lockstep with you here. I, I really I look going through the names and looking at them. I think Cesaro makes a ton of sense. And I really want to pick Cesaro, but we've already kind of laid out how the story is going to play out. And so because of that, I think it's going to be Kevin Owens. I the, just, yep. it, it, it's sad, but I think it's going to be Kevin Owens. And then both you and I would agree that Roman Reigns is going to win. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I don't see any chance for, for Kevin Owens to win that. Now the Raw Women's Championship, we've got Asuka versus Lacey Evans. Now we've already mentioned that Lacey Evans is pregnant. 
Um, if this match takes place, if this match takes place, Oscar wins it, baby. <laughs> I don't know how you put that belt on 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 Lacey Evans. Right. I don't know how you do that. So uh, we'll, we'll both go with Oscar, and if they do something different, it'll be interesting. And I could see Ric Flair getting involved, but I don't know how she ends up dropping the belt later on. It, whatever. I don't know if this match will even take place. Uh, United States Championship. We've got Bobby Lashley versus Keith Lee versus Matt Riddle. And I've got some news on what's going on with the Hurt Business in the News and Notes segment. So stick around for that because uh, the head dog of, of the Hurt Business is dealing with a bit of an injury. So do we have Bobby Lashley drop the title to either Keith Lee or Riddle? Uh, I'm going to go Matt Riddle in this. I just I feel like it's an interesting story. Um, we'll see what happens. This might be the one where uh, we end up differing, and this could be the one where you end up taking the points. Yeah, because I see it where – Lashley and Riddle need to fight, but maybe not have a title involved. So I see Keith Lee winning with mm. potentially Riddle doing something to piss off Bobby Lashley. Because you saw that uh, Lashley got over on Raw and, and put him in the nice headlock and things like that uh, with the with the um, Lucha House Party just staring there and uh, doing their thing. So for me, I think it's time to give the big man a belt. So for me, it's Keith Lee. Now, I could totally see it. Look, either way, we both think Bobby Lashley's yeah, dropping, dropping the, the title here. Yeah. Um, Keith Lee, I could totally see winning, winning the whole damn thing. Um, these matches might happen, might not happen. Not a hundred percent sure. This is a little bit of spitballing. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is coming from SmackDown. So it's going to depend on what takes place on Friday night's go home show. Um, so we're going to include them on this prediction. Uh, if they make it, they make it. If they don't, they don't. Uh, we've got the Intercontinental Championship being represented. Big E versus Apollo Crews. How do you see that playing out? Great match. Highlight Apollo Crews, but Big E keeps the title. I think the same thing. Um, I don't see Apollo taking it off Big E, at least not yet. Um, we'll see what happens with, with Apollo Crews as he continues to get developed a little bit. Uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championship. You've got Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler, who are the champions, taking on the Street Profits. Uh, how do you think that one would play out? If it goes down... I need to see the Street Profits with the belt going into Mania. Yeah, I would like to see the Street Profits with the belt as well. Um, look, I I like Bobby Roode. Uh, I like Dolph Ziggler. I think them as a as a heel tag team is is fun. It's interesting. I don't necessarily think they're the most credible. Um, if we get this match, this is again lazy booking, lazy writing. Sasha Banks versus Carmilla for the Women's SmackDown Championship. Easy baby, uh, easy baby. Yeah. <laughs> Sasha Banks will take it yeah. down. It was okay. definitely. All right. So to recap real quick, we both have Sasha Banks, Car uh, Sasha Banks beating Carmilla. We both have the street profits taking down Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler. We both have big E retaining against Apollo Cruz. Now where we differ is in the Bobby Lashley, Keith Lee, Matt Riddle match. I've got Matt Riddle winning. You have Keith Lee winning. We both have Oscar beating a pregnant Lacey Evans. We both have Roman Reigns winning against whoever wins the elimination chamber. We both have Kevin Owens winning the Elimination Chamber to go on and take on Roman Reigns. And then we both have Drew McIntyre winning. And the card is tied 1-1 right now. Ooh, or 1.5 to 1.5. It's going to be fun. I'm going to look forward to the Elimination Chamber. It could get real violent. Always one of the pay-per-views that always provides some intrigue. All right, Cuz, hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? In a recent interview, Cody Rhodes said he's leaving the door open for AEW and WWE to cross over. He said, there's no reason there couldn't be a promotional WWE crossover one day. And I don't mean that a thing that's been discussed or happening, but none of those rules that exist for other places exist for us. So possibly one day, AEW wrestlers showing up on WWE and WWE wrestlers showing up on AEW. Cody says it's a possibility. Now on Monday night, MVP may have really hurt himself. PW Insider's Mike Johnson reported Tuesday that MVP traveled to Birmingham, Alabama, to have his knee examined. The extent of the injury remains unclear. This all occurred after his match on Monday. He had to be helped to the back because he couldn't walk on his knee. Now, Dave Meltzer was discussing uh, where Aleister Black and Andrade are on the SmackDown card since Paul Heyman is over there doing some work and has a little bit of pull. Uh, Dave Meltzer says... He doesn't have that kind of power right now. And if he had power, yeah, he could see those guys getting a little bit of a push. But he does not have that power. And Vince does not see anything in Aleister Black or Andrade. So we've got three guys here who may be sidelined for quite some time. And MVP dealing with a knee injury, going to see Dr. Andrews down in Birmingham, Alabama. 
and Alistair Black and Andrade. Apparently, creative's got nothing for them, and it doesn't look like they'll be coming back anytime soon. Now, Meltzer also said that it's a matter of time before the likes of guys like Okada, Jay White, and other big names from New Japan come over and join AEW and Impact in this crossover that they've got going on. The Forbidden Door is wide open, and you now have guys moving about between AEW, Impact, and New Japan, and it'll just be a matter of time before we get the likes of Okada versus Kenny Omega again, uh, Jay White uh, taking on the likes of John Moxley. Um, so just sit tight, and we'll see what happens with New Japan, AEW, and Impact. Now, have you ever wondered how much wrestlers make, Doc? Absolutely. I always want to know what these guys are earning per match or, or uh, their, their, their guarantees. Well, Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Radio noted that there's a huge disparity between the shows. He said that they're not making 250 grand or 300 grand or anything like that. Balor, I'm sure is, but I don't think anyone else is. There's probably in the low hundreds. I know one top person in NXT who's been there for a long time and he should be making a ton, but he's making 130 grand. So they're making like 130, 150. Adam Cole may be making a little bit more as he should be, but that's about the range. NXT, you usually see the start at about 60 grand, maybe 50, depending on who you are. If you're like a guy who was a football player, you'll get a little bit more and then you'll get raises to a certain point. There might be guys who make more than that, but not much more. The number now Meltzer was referring to there, it's probably the downside. It's basically what their base contract is. It doesn't include anything, any of their merch sales or any of their products that get sold. So coming in, you're probably making about 50 grand, maybe 60 grand. And then you can maybe rise up as much as 130, maybe 150. Guys like Adam Cole make that. Finn Balor is probably closer to 250. Um, so... When we look at it, it sounds like a lot of money, but for being on the road 300 days a year, mm, I don't know if it's worth it. Now, reports are beginning to circulate uh, early in the week that AEW had heat with Sammy Guevara after the young wrestler reportedly voiced his concerns with an angle that would have sent him to impact. Now, you remember last week, Sammy Guevara left AEW and said, I need a break from the business. What was supposed to happen is he was supposed to go over to Impact, and he was supposed to do an angle in Impact, leaving AEW, basically taking a break from AEW, going to Impact, and then coming back. Now, the reports note that some in AEW, particularly those high up within the promotion, were concerned that Sammy's actions may have jeopardized the relationship between AEW and Impact, although that doesn't appear to have been what has happened. Now, Chris Jericho and Tony Khan both pissed off at Sammy Guevara, uh, Chris Jericho told the guys over at Impact, ban Sammy from, from the premises. Do not allow him in. When he shows up, you send him right back to us. There's no need for him to be there for you. So Sam McVar was going to have a little bit of a run in Impact, and it is now he's now on disciplinary action. And WWE is currently on a signing spree, signing over 24 new wrestlers with the likes of Blake Christian, Taya Valkyrie, and Harlem Bravado. And that's it for this week's jam-packed wrestling news and notes. Great podcast, sir. Thanks, everybody, for downloading anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. All you got to do is hit and search Detroit Sports Podcast, and when you hit that subscribe button, all our daily content finds you. Make sure to follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast, and we appreciate all the banter We'll be paying attention during the Elimination Chamber. If, if anything catches your eye, feel free, hit us up. Thanks, cause I look forward to reviewing what goes down during this crazy week of professional wrestling.